Welcome everyone. I think we'll get started. Um, I'm welcome to the trustees conservation in action webinar series. My name is Cindy Brockway and I'm the program director for cultural resources here at the trustees. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And I hope you're excited to get an in depth look at how we care for our special places. Each one of our 123 properties has its own unique history and treasures to offer. And our team of historians, preservationists, designers, and many others all play a role in bringing our places to life. These efforts would not be possible without the support of our donors, and we cannot thank them enough. Today, you'll hear about our exceptional relationship between Frederick Law Olmsted, notable father of landscape architecture, and his apprentice and later business partner, Charles Elliott. Olmsted defined the American park movement of the 19th century. He also, he's also the genius behind our own Moraine Farm. Elliot envisioned bits of scenery reserved like books in a library or art in a museum for the enjoyment of Massachusetts residents, an idea that shaped our organization and that of the Department of um, Conservation and Recreation, at least that's its new name. As the world went virtual these past two years, we created online programming like this webinar series. Our team has done an incredible job of keeping our properties open and operating safely. We saw over 2 million visitors to our properties last year, as many people gained a renewed appreciation for nature and getting outside. I hope these webinars will inspire you to get out and explore a trustee's property and help you learn about our many new projects and initiatives. We believe this work will help us get the next generation outside and build the trustees of the future. Thank you again for supporting our mission uh, to protect and share the places that people love. Please submit questions and answers today on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. The presenters will respond to your questions at the end of the presentation. Also, next to the Q&A button, you will see a live transcript option. If you would like to enable closed captions to appear at the bottom of your screen, please select live transcript and show subtitle. Thank you. We have two speakers today. Keith Morgan is a well-known historian in 19th and 20th century American and European architecture, who's interested in the relationship between architecture, urban planning, and landscape architecture. He's taught at Boston University since 1980, and he's a member of our own Cultural Resources Committee. Lauren Meyer is the associate editor of the most recent volume of the papers of Frederick Law Olmsted, a historic preservationist and registered landscape architect Lauren has specialized in the research, planning, and treatment of cultural landscapes, including the restoration of Olmsted's Brookline home and office, Fairstead. And she's currently the president of the Friends of Fairstead. I welcome two of my favorite scholars and friends to share their insight today and thank them for their generosity in doing this program for us. Lauren, I will let you take over. Thank you so much, Cindy. Such a pleasure to be here. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to give a very brief overview of the work of, of landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted with an emphasis on just a few iconic projects and work completed during the 1880s and 1890s. This is by no means a comprehensive overview, but I hope it will give you a sense of his ideals as a landscape architect as we celebrate the bicentennial of Olmsted's birth in 2022. Born in Hartford, Connecticut in 1826, Olmsted had a diverse upbringing with many professions before finding his final calling. He trained in surveying, engineering, chemistry, and scientific farming, and developed this knowledge through experimental agriculture at his farm on Staten Island. In 1850, he traveled through England and visited some of the great 18th and 19th century English landscapes, such as Birkenhead Park. As a journalist, he traveled extensively through the South, writing for Putnam's Monthly and later The Nation. Beginning in 1861, Olmsted served as General Secretary of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, where he managed the care, treatment, and distribution of supplies to over 8,000 sick and wounded soldiers. These experiences would greatly inform his design ideals and commitment to a just, healthy, and civil society. 
Critical Olmsted is widely recognized as the founder of the professional practice of landscape architecture in the U.S. He is not the first person to be a designer of landscapes, and his predecessors practiced what was then called landscape gardening. Olmsted's first partnership was with architect Calvert Fox in New York. You will note that there are, in fact, three Olmsteads. John Charles began, began assisting his father in 1875, and the firm grew over time, ultimately moving to Brookline to include his son, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., and many others. Olmsted had named Henry Sargent Codman, the nephew of Charles Frank Sargent, as a partner in 1889. Charles Elliott apprenticed with Olmsted and then left the firm but rejoined again after Codman's death in order to assist with the workload in the newly named Olmsted, Olmsted, and Elliott office. But the early death of Elliott resulted in the immediate need for Olmsted's youngest son, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., to join John Charles in the new firm of Olmsted Brothers, landscape architects. Over a period of about 130 years, the firm consulted on approximately 6,000 projects nationwide and abroad. Olmsted's earliest work as a landscape architect addressed many of the problems associated with the rapid growth of cities, namely sanitation and health. His innovations in developing Americans' urban parks and park systems are one of his greatest contributions. His first and perhaps best known is, of course, Central Park. Olmsted was initially hired to direct the clear, clearing of the site in preparation for construction when architect Calvert Box invited Olmsted to develop an entry for the park design competition. Olmsted and Box submitted the winning entry titled Greensward in April 1858. Vox designed many of the bridges, and Olmsted laid out a complex plan with walks and drives, rustic, picturesque features, and pastoral greensward. But Olmsted did not fully commit to the profession of landscape architecture until he was in his 40s in 1865. Olmsted began work on Mount Royal in Montreal in 1874, just before the Boston Park System. Here he proposed to enhance the character and mountain feeling of the site and provide a circulation system that made possible a continuous landscape experience to the top of the mountain. The steep and rugged areas above would have evergreen trees to block the wind and vegetation native to this northern climate. As, many, as in many of his other parks, Olmsted was concerned about public access to landscape scenery for the infirm, and the plan for Mount Royal includes a navigable path to the summit that was graded to allow access for individuals in wheelchairs. In 1891, Olmsted began planning a park and parkway system for Louisville, Kentucky. He praised the quality of the scenery at the Cherokee Park site and planned a circuit drive throughout the park. Olmsted proposed to treat the forested hill of Iroquois Park as a scenic reservation, much in the fashion he had treated Mount Royal. He planned a carriage drive that would gradually ascend the small mountain, circle the summit, and descend by another route. Four carriage concourses were set at specific vista points. Olmsted and Box began work on South Park in Chicago in 1869, and Olmsted returned again to the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893, a project that demanded extensive resources and which prompted the return of Charles Eliot to the office after the death of Henry Codman. The exposition provided Olmsted an opportunity to undertake landscape improvements to the lagoon as an unrestrained and informal presentation of natural scenery as foil to the highly enriched, refined, and delicate gardening of other parts of the exposition fairground and its classical architecture. The park system Olmsted designed in Boston and Brookline 
Massachusetts between 1876 and his retirement was his most extensive and the one on which he labored the greatest amount of time, even relocating his home and office to Brookline in 1883. Olmsted's plan in 1879 for the Back Bay Fence was inspired by the tidal marshes of coastal Massachusetts. He proposed a large basin to address sanitation and periodic flooding and placed a tide gate between the basin and the Charles River to reduce the tidal fluctuation to one foot. Once the scenic characteristics, drainage and sanitation issues were addressed, Olmsted turned to the circulation system, adding carriage drives around the boundary wall along with walking and bridle paths. Photographs of the Muddy River during construction and after show the detail of the engineering and design and the character of the planted landscape approximately 20 years after construction. In the section of Olmsted Park that became Leverett Pond, he replaced the brackish swamp with a freshwater pond bordered by paths and beaches. <clears throat> Upstream, a series of small natural history pools and a babbling brook connected towards pond. The roughly 500 acre site of Franklin Park provided varied terrain well suited for a large park. 335 acres of the park were described as a country park designed with an aesthetic simplicity. Olmsted also collaborated with Charles Brick Sargent on the design of the Arnold Arboretum. He argued for the role the Arboretum could play also as a public pleasure ground with the design of a curvilinear carriage drive. Working with Sargent, also, all, Olmsted also prepared a series of distribution plans for the arrangement of plant families following the Bentham and Hooker classification system. Stanford University provided the opportunity to design a new campus on the Palo Alto farm of Leyland Stanford, built as a memorial to his only child. Developed with Shepley, Rutan, and Coolidge, his 1885 plan, 1888 plan, excuse me, established the concept for the main quadrangle, oval, and adjacent land divisions that were originally intended to support academic housing and an arboretum. Planted circles in the center of the main quads support a complex layering of palms and shrubs with careful considerations in the outer campus regarding planting in an arid environment. In 1873, Congress commissioned Olmsted to design the enlarged grounds for the US Capitol. And in 1874, he presented a plan that provided a symmetrical park-like setting with low walls, trees, and shrubs, and a series of curvilinear walks that provided views of the Capitol. A new marble terrace wrapped around the north, south, and west facades. In contrast, Olmsted's extensive collaborations with H.H. H. Richardson in Northeastern included the grounds for the Ames Memorial Hall, begun in 1881. Here, Olmsted created a landscape plan in which rustic steps and walls and picturesque planting reinforced the stone character of the building and its rugged site. The late 19th century was also a time of great expansion for railroads and the development of suburbs. Olmsted's collaborations with Richardson and Sargent led to an extensive set of projects for the Boston, Boston and Albany Railroad from Boston to Palmer, where Olmsted designed the setting for several stations by Richardson that would provide easy access and a landscape counterpoint to the industrial corridor of the rail line. Similarly, his extensive work for the Ames family in Northeastern also included the landscape for the old colony rail line adjacent to the Ames shovel factory. Although it predates Elliott's time in the Olmsted office, the 1868 Olmsted and Box plan for Riverside near Chicago is his most well-known and well-executed plan for a designed residential community that included his distinctive 
curvilinear road system, vegetated parkways, and shared open space. Olmsted's use of curvilinear roads provides the varied experience of scenery he felt was more suitable in a suburban setting, in contrast to the straight lines and direct travel necessitated in a city grid. Sidewalks provided access to fresh air, open space, and exercise. During the 1880s and 90s, the firm completed many residential communities in Brookline, Swampscott, and Lynn, Massachusetts, as well as Newport, Rhode Island, Sudbrook, Maryland, and Druid Hills in Atlanta. Holmes's plans for summer communities combined many of his design ideals for both, both parks and residential communities. Cushing's Island in Casco Bay, Maine was laid out with the goal of creating a summer cottage community of like-minded residences with a shoreline protected for common use and views. Houses were to be designed using local stone and natural materials, harmonious with the landscape. Charles Elliott accompanied Olmsted on his visit to the island, and Olmsted's report provides the most comprehensive description of his goals for a summer community in a natural setting. For Lake Wakanda at Perry Park in Colorado, Olmsted designed a summer community also with guidelines for architectural design and the treatment of the landscape in the arid environment. Not surprising, private homes and estates are the largest single category of work for the Olmsted firm. Olmsted had noted that the grounds of suburban and rural homes were often created for display rather than used for the benefit of the health and well being of their inhabitants. He advocated for features that would engage family activities and promote access to fresh air, sunshine, and exercise. These open air apartments offered families the experience of natural scenery. He wrote that a complete subordination of features is much more conducive to a quiet and cheerfully musing state of mind. This was also a reaction against the fashionable gardening at the time. His own home, Fairstead, on the uh, left, was created beginning in 1883 from a small farmstead located down the street from H.H. H. Richardson and Charles Craig Sargent in Brookline. Here he was able to create his ideal residential home ground, as well as a full-scale landscape architecture office. Nearby, his design for the landscape of the Storrow House incorporated many of the rustic and pastoral features found at Fairstead. Built between 1889 and 1895, the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina was Olmsted's largest private residence. Originally 125,000 acres in size, the estate was developed to include a commercial forest, a scenic deer park, as well as extensive gardens and terraces, an esplanade, vistas, walled gardens with conservatories, and a three mile long approach drive. Olmsted designed an extensive arboretum with plant groups arranged by family in the southern half of the estate. Nearby Biltmore Village provided housing, transportation, a hospital, and shopping for the estate staff. One of the most important country places designed by Olmsted is Moraine Farm in Beverly. Beginning in 1881, Olmsted realized one of the most carefully planned country place estates of his career that incorporated the house grounds, new forest plantations, and a working farm. His primary objective was to create a countryside retreat for the Phillips family. The approach drive unfolds through a series of contrasting landscape spaces arriving at the house, which was set on a promontory with a curvilinear terrace by Olmsted overlooking Wenham Lake. The coping treatment on the terrace wall is similar to the terraces at Ames Memorial Hall in Northeastern on which Olmsted was also working at the time. 40 acres of pasture land were set aside for dairy cows, 
the remaining land Olmsted advised should be treated so that it would appear as if it was in a natural condition. He recommended plantations of pine and larch with native deciduous trees that would over time establish the true character of the place. A large lawn bordered by shrubs connected seamlessly to the terrace and house, providing the open air apartment Olmsted favored. It included an enclosed pavilion at the south end of the lawn that functioned as a summer or tea house. At the request of Mrs. Phillips, Olmsted and John Charles designed an old fashioned garden created with perennials of sprawling habit and set eight feet below the level of the lawn to be viewed from above. Olmsted collaborated with Peabody and Stearns, architect of the house, on several commission, commissions, many of which were initiated or completed during the 1880s and 90s, including Groton and Lawrenceville schools and several country estates, particular, particularly to the Sloan family in Lenox, Massachusetts. In closing, I'd like to note that there are many factors that define an Olmsted landscape beyond the 6,000 job numbers over a third of which are in Massachusetts alone. Those that had design plans created and implemented and which retain integrity a century after they were created have much to teach us about the enduring legacy of this master designer. This would not be possible without the landscape stewards and archives that preserve these historic records and their associated landscapes, including the National Park Service, the Library of Congress, and I note the Trustees Archives and Research Center that holds the records for the Olmsted landscapes of Moraine Farm, World's End, and the Olmsted Brothers Garden at the Crane Estate. Olmsted believed in the unconscious healing effect of natural scenery. Late in his career, he noted, the root of all my good work is an early respect for, regard, and enjoyment of scenery and the extraordinary opportunities for cultivating the susceptibility to the power of scenery. And with that, I will turn it over to Keith Morgan. Thank you, Lauren, and welcome everyone. Um, I want to turn from the gravitas uh, to, of Frederick Law Olmsted at the height of his career to uh, a young, fellow in a charming plaid dress that you see here in the photograph on the left, who represents in many ways more of a landscape visionary than the landscape architect who was his mentor. We see Charles Eliot, no middle initial here. Uh, he was born on November 1st, 1859, at a point when Olmsted Sr. was just beginning to work on Central Park. In the photograph, he's with his mother, Ellen Derby Peabody uh, Elliott, and his younger brother, Samuel Atkins Elliott, who will become an important Unitarian preacher and the head of the Unitarian Association. Uh, the oval portrait on the right is another image of young Elliott. His mother sadly died a decade after his birth from pneumonia, uh, just at the point, let's see if I can get the things to advance, Oops, just at the point that his father, whom you see here in a profile photograph, Charles W. Elliott, with a middle initial, unlike his son, had been appointed uh, the new president of Harvard College. Father Elliott was uh, a chemist by training and had taken his family abroad for a period of time to study laboratory techniques and pedagogy at European, especially German universities, which brought him a much broader worldview, which he uh, used to um, advance his career as an educational administrator. During the four decades that he was president of Harvard College, he radically reshaped not only that institution, but ex by example, American higher education at large, moving from a curriculum that is based 
in the classics and religion at an earlier point into greater reliance on the sciences and graduate programs as represented by Eliot's looking out at the new campus of the Harvard Medical School of 1905. While young Charles Eliot did well in school and in college, he was really somewhat orphaned by the death of his mother and the appointment of his father to the college presidency in exactly the same year. And it took him a long time to really get his grounding. Where he had a great passion was in his love of nature. And during his undergraduate years at Harvard, he gathered a group of classmates to camp on Mount Desert Island in Maine, where the Elliott family had a summer house, and to begin a long-term recording project of the natural history of the island, something that the gentleman that you see out in front of that camp uh, site uh, continued uh, for many years afterwards, uh, producing important publications. When he completed Harvard, uh, Eliot was really somewhat adrift and decided that he would take courses at a component of Harvard called the Bussey Institute, primarily an agricultural focused um, educational component. And for two years, he studied practical skills uh, and plant material in that manner. His uncle, the architect, uh, Robert Swain Peabody, worked often with the Olmsted office on uh, joint projects, such as Moraine Farm, which is a major focus of our conversation today. And through his uncle, Charles Eliot was introduced to Frederick Olmsted in 1883 and became the first unpaid apprentice in the Olmsted office in that year that Olmsted had moved his practice from New York City up to Boston. Uh, I spent yesterday afternoon with Charles Eliot, uh, rereading his diaries for the two years that he was in the Olmsted firm in hope that I would be able to discover that he was actually taken to Moraine Farm by Olmsted or by his uncle to inspect that site. But sadly, that doesn't seem to have happened at that moment. Nevertheless, he spent two years in the Olmsted office working on key projects such as the laying out of the Arnold Arboretum for Olmsted's uh, Brookline neighbor, Charles Sprague Sargent, the first director of the site. And as I say, becoming the first of a cadre of important uh, apprentices and young uh, trainees in the Olmsted office, such as you see on the top to the left. After two years in the Umstead office, Elliot came to the conclusion he'd learned what he could from trailing around as a God's body uh, in the older man's wake. And so he set off on two expeditions, first along the east coast of the United States, uh, through a series of trips as far south as the Smoky Mountains, uh, <clears throat> and then back up into Pennsylvania, visiting key designed landscapes and natural landscapes along that route. And then in November of 1885, he sailed to Europe for almost a full year of study uh, and visits to key sites in his own self-education of this new profession he wanted to join. The early winter months were spent uh, in the British Museum Library which was a great circular space in those days that you see at the top, where he tried to religiously read the literature in French, German, and English of the profession he was starting to join. Uh, as a neurotic academic, uh, during a year that I spent in London, uh, I had the call slips that Eliot had used, or copies of them, and was trying to read the same books on the same day to sort of climb into his worldview itself. Uh, after his time in the library, Eliot used the wonderful connections that his father, President Eliot, his mentor, F.L. Olmsted, and others provided to him, uh, connections to key figures in the landscape conservation movement that was solidifying in England in those days. He met and gained a knowledge from people like James Bryce, the uh, Oxford historian and parliamentarian that you see there in the upper left-hand corner, who was in the process of trying to get past a bill for access to the Scottish mountains. 
We know that Elliot attended uh, lobbying sessions by Shaw Lefebvre, another politician who was trying to set aside the Hampstead Heath in North London as a preserved landscape. He traveled north to the Lake District to meet with a man named Conan Roundsley, the secretary of Lake, the Lakeland Defense Society, whose vicarage at Keswick you see in the lower right corner, and a view of Lake Thurmere you see at the top, one of a series of beautiful Lake District lakes that uh, Kenan Roundsley was trying to preserve as natural settings rather than as reservoirs for nearby industrial cities. Um, then he took off on a series of separate uh, expeditions across Europe, heading as far east as Russia and as far south as the northern tier of Italy, making detailed descriptions of the sites that he visited that he would send back in correspondence to his former colleagues in the Olmsted office, his family and other friends, and keeping a sketchbook in which he recorded the landscapes he visited. Formal sites, such as you see in the plans and profile for the Tuileries Gardens in the upper left corner, or the Lac dos Monnaies in the Bois de Vincennes in Paris on the right, or broader, larger landscapes, such as the Puerto uh, 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 River Valley coming into Portofino uh, that you see in the lower left corner, and then images of the village and the castle nestle, nestled into the hillside around it. Probably the most important site that he visited in his European Hygiera was the estate of Prince Hermann von Puckler at Moskau, or Bad Moskau, but the meaning bath uh, in German, uh, which is now on the border between Germany and Poland. It is a 850 acre uh, area, a whole river valley that was owned by this German prince who from 1815 onward uh, spent all of his energy and most of his financial resources trying to turn it into an idealized landscape. One that Charles Eliot was mesmerized by and really uh, haunted much of his future planning uh, as a landscape visionary. And here you see the plan that he purchased through a friend he met in Berlin of the Moscow site. The uh, contrast between the German prince, who was a rather bizarre romantic character, as you see on the right, and the prophet of the future Boston landscape, the very serious and studious Charles Eliot on the left, uh, is an interesting contrast in opposites. And at the same time, they are men who were cut from the same cloth. They both come from highly educated, very privileged backgrounds. They both become determined to develop landscapes. In the case of the prince, ones that he is able to control, at least until he declares bankruptcy and sadly has to sell the estate at Bad Moscow, or in the case of Olmsted, through landscapes that he brings into the public domain in two important different ways. Um, in his letters back to the Olmsted office and to other friends, he describes what he found at Moscow. And allow me to quote while we look at the schloss that the prince built as a centerpiece of his estate. At Moscow, the village is surrounded by a park the Schloss standing close beside the village near the river Nysa. Uh, my walk was long and most interesting. This is landscape art gardening on a grand scale and the re resulting scenery is extremely lovely. His park is probably the finest work of real landscape gardening on a large scale that this century has seen carried out in Europe. It is a work that has made me very proud of the profession. For here was a river valley in great part barren, fringed by monstrous woods of Pinus Silvestris and in no way remarkable for beauty or interest. But now one of the loveliest vales on earth, full to the brim, so to speak, of variety, pleasant change, of quieting and often touching beauty. Uh, we find um, Puckler intent on including in one landscape scheme his slosh, 
excuse me, his schloss, his village, his alum works, and the slopes and levels that include them, intent on evolving out of the confused situation, a composition in which all that is fundamentally characteristic of scenery, history, and industry should be united. And here you have photographs that Elliot uh, purchased at the time, a view from a hillside over the alum factory and the uh, village and the castle in the background, a great meadow extending out from the castle on one side, and part of the perfected river valley uh, in a modern photograph there on the left, on the right, excuse me. Now, Eliot wrote back, excuse me, Eliot wrote often to Olmsted, and Olmsted wrote back at one point saying, I have seen no such justly critical notes as yours on landscape architecture matters from any traveler for a generation past. You ought to make it part of your scheme to write for the public a little at a time, if you please, but methodically, systematically. It is part of your professional duty to do so. Well, when Eliot returned at the end of 1886 to Boston, he resisted invitations from Olmsted to rejoin the firm and set up his own practice in Boston. But he did take Olmsted's advice seriously. And in, from 1886 through 1897, he joined in an enterprise that Charles Sprague Sargent, the director of the Arnold Arboretum, on whose laying out Elliot had worked as an apprentice, and Olmsted uh, worked on together. A new journal called Garden and Forest, conducted by Sargent, but published in New York City. Many of the articles were written by Mariana Schuyler Van Rensselaer, whose uh, sculpted portrait by Augustus St. Gaudens you see there on the uh, right of a Charles Sprague Sargent's photograph. Um, but Charles Eliot was a key contributor, um, uh, submitting 21 articles over the decade long length of that publication. Articles such as a chronological review of the bibliography of what any aspiring landscape architect should read in the order in which he should read it. The result of his knowledge from those months of the dreary winter in the British Museum Library. Also very importantly, early on, he began a series of analytical articles on American culture, country estates, three of them in the Boston periphery and three in the Hudson Valley in which just as the example on the screen now of the Vale, the Lyman family estate of the late 18th and early 19th century in Waltham, Massachusetts could be analyzed and understood in much the same way as Eliot approached uh, the discussion of the, um, the estate at Puckler, Moscow's uh, residence in Germany. Here you see a river similarly snaking through the property, the key house site here at number three, other parts of the farm buildings, deer park grasslands, uh, et cetera, all lovingly carefully developed. And also in Garden in Forest in 1892 was published an article on the Phillips estate on Moraine Farm <clears throat> that was introduced uh, in Lauren's uh, presentation. Maddeningly, the uh, article is not credited to any particular individual. We assume the Olmsted office wrote it. It may have been written by the staff of the uh, Garden and Forest Journal. It could even be ghosted by Charles Eliot himself, since some of the language I find to be very similar to things that uh, Eliot talks about. The article is called A Modern Massachusetts Farm, and I'd like to just sort cite a brief section of the description. We feel that an estate like this, managed intelligently, on a system conceived and developed with a view to the best permanent economic results, is an object lesson of real public importance. Any well-planned and prudently conducted uh, experiment which directs public attention to the possibility and advantage of using lands not otherwise valuable in a way to secure a fair profit to their owner helps to establish and enlarge the prosperity of the state. 
is the sort of large vision that Eliot is frequently uh, uh, sprouting, uh, spouting in his various entries in Garden and Forest uh, monthly publication. As many of you probably know, the most important for our purposes is one that appeared in January of 1890 when Eliot wrote an article called The Waverly Oaks, A Plan for Their Preservation for the People. He proposed a state agency to hold, hold quote, small and well-distributed parcels of land free of taxes, just as the public library holds books and the art museum pictures in trust for the Commonwealth. <clears throat> Here you see photographs, the upper left of some of the oaks at the at Waverly Oaks, the nearby Beaver Brook, which is a key part of this larger landscape site, and a painting by Winslow Homer, then resident in Belmont, Massachusetts, uh, which the Waverly Oaks borders um, with Waltham that was painted by uh, Winslow Homer in 1864. The Waverly Oaks were already a site sought out by various poets and the Boston Sketch Club. So a key object to use as the focus for this new proposed concept. Elliot was already at that point uh, the counselor for topography in the Appalachian Mountain Club. And the fact that the trustees of reservation has recently and wisely invited John Judge, the uh, former president of the Appalachian Mountain Club to become the new president of the trustees brings us back full circle into the kind of connections that Olmsted was using to develop his landscape preservation and historic preservation concepts in the 1890s. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to the importance of archivists, both the archivist at the trustees, Allison Bassett, and also the archivist at the Appalachian Mountain Club, Becky Fullerton, who provided the objects you see on the screen now. Charles Eliot's uh, registration card uh, as a member of the Appalachian Mountain Club, and also Philip Chase, a man who will become a key player with Olmsted at the Appalachian Mountain Club, the trustees, and the eventual Metropolitan Park Commission. So Eliot uses the AMC as the launching pad uh, three months after publishing that article in Garden and Forest to create a committee, which then calls a statewide meeting held at the MIT campus in the Back Bay. The card uh, inviting people to attend that is the one from the upper left corner from the MC archives with Elliot's handwritten note. This card was distributed for the meeting of May 24th, 1890. And then below is a page from the wonderful scrapbook Elliot kept that recorded all the activities, what he and other people were doing in the area of land conservation and landscape architecture. That meeting, of course, read, led quickly to the founding in 1891 of the Trustees of Reservation as a statewide nonprofit corporation to acquire land through gift and acquisition. With the creation of the Trustees of Reservation in 1891, Elliot realized that he wasn't going to be able to move as quickly as he wanted to, and that his real concern was the disappearance of important landscape elements in the greater metropolitan Boston area. So as he'd used the AMC to launch the trustees, he quickly formed a committee of the trustees to then move to the establishment of a temporary a metropolitan park commission to unify the landscape needs of all the Boston towns, to use Eliot's terms, a consortium of the greater Boston basin and beyond to have unified landscape preservation development. Interesting, early sites of the uh, trustees of reservation, such as Virginia Woods, the uh, plaque dedicating that site that was given in 1894, morphed into properties of the Metropolitan Park Commission as it was established by 1893. And I want to use just one example of the Metropolitan Park Commission because Virginia Wood became part of an area known as the Middlesex Fells. And that allows us to make sure that we don't give Elliot unique credit for all that was going on. In the case of Boston, there were other people who were 
co-conspirators, if you will, or even predecessors, men like Eliezer Wright, who visited England in the 1840s and came home determined to encourage landscape, uh, public landscape development in the Boston area through articles he wrote in the Boston papers and land he began to assemble in what would become the Middlesex Fells, including his own farm in the photograph at the bottom. A little later, uh, a Malden-based journalist named Sylvester Baxter became a key partner with Elliot in these ideals of the trustees and then the Metropolitan Park System. Baxter was a great admirer of German forest ma management and regional planning. And so he became at the MPC, uh, the secretary to the commission with Elliot as the consulting landscape architect. At this point in the 1890s, large scale institutionalization was happening. For example, you have the formation of the Boston Metropolitan, excuse me, the Boston Sewage District that incorporates many towns in 1891, uh, and then the founding of the Boston Water Commission in 1895 all networking in with the creation of a metropolitan park system. And Elliot's large vision can be represented by design such as the one there at the very center top that shows his focus on the harbor islands and the ocean beaches as areas that should come into the public domain. He very carefully with assistance in the now Olmsted, Olmsted and Elliot office, having rejoined the firm in 1893, began to uh, completely record the condition of landscape areas he wanted to acquire, such as the folded map that you see in the lower right, that you'll have to take my word for it has the detail of information of actual tree by tree species and former cellar holes, examples of former uh, human occupation on the land that turns into landscape parks such as the Middlesex Fells, only one of a whole system Elliot created. But as you've already come to realize, sadly, Elliot dies of spinal meningitis uh, in the spring of 1897, uh, when he is only 37 years old, uh, leaving both the trustees and the Metropolitan Park System without a real guiding hand. Although he does uh, managed to write, and it is posthumously published in 1898, something called Vegetation and Scenery in the Metropolitan Reservations of Boston uh, that becomes a bit of a template or master plan moving forward. Now, the trustees had been, in some ways, left orphanless. Oops, can we go back one? Well, you all know all those properties for some reason, unless you can make it back up for me, Lauren. Uh, the trustees had not acquired much in the way of design, thank you, designed landscapes during its first four decades. The early properties were ones that focused on large scale land conservation questions. And it's not until 19, 29, that the uh, William Cullen Bryan homestead, upper left corner, was acquired. 1938, the old manse uh, center uh, left, uh, excuse me, center uh, top uh, right hand corner in Concord. Uh, following that, uh, the uh, Eleanor Cabot Bradley estate down in the lower uh, right corner of 1945, uh, then the Mission House in uh, Stockbridge in 1948, uh, 1949, Castle Hill, the magnificent huge estate of the Crane family uh, in Ipswich, Massachusetts, and in 59, Nong Keg up here uh, in sort of the center left. These are all beginning to form around a key moment in the history of the historic preservation movement in the, in the United States. And that is the founding of the National Trust for Historic Preservation in 1949, the early symbol of which you see there on the left. Of course, the founding of the National Trust in the United States in 49 was dependent upon the establishment of the Natural, National Trust 
for places of historic interest and natural beauty in Great Britain back in 1895, which was ultimately modeled on the founding of the Trustees of Public Reservations in Massachusetts in 1891. Lauren, you'll have to move it forward for me, please. So finally, we come to a key moment in 1945 when the uh, members of the trustees were debating whether they should remove the term public from their name, just as later we move, remove uh, of reservations from the name as well. Uh, public was being removed in 1945 as these documents sent out to the membership uh, test. And you don't have to understand the small print here other than to understand that they were not changing the sort of sub clause that defined the mission of the organization. It was still to be the trustees of reservation for natural beauty and historic interest. Interestingly, the reverse of the trust, the uh, National Trust uh, in England, which was for places of historic interest and natural beauty. This then brings us to a final image. If I can ask you to advance it again, Lauren, please. Uh, and that is the moment when sadly in the spring of 1897, while working on parks in Hartford, Connecticut, as you see in the photograph on the uh, right there, Elliot uh, succumbed to uh, meningitis and died within uh, a matter of just a few days. His protege in the Olmsted firm, Arthur Shercliffe, took this uh, very uh, penetrating photograph on the upper left corner, corner that shows Elliot's desk, desk at the Olmsted, Olmsted and Elliot office on the day that he died. And in the lower left corner, again, the plan for Moraine Farm, the Phillips estate uh, in um, Beverly. And I want to try and come full circle by using once again Elias words from his description of Puckler Moscow's estate, which he saw as an ideal and inspired in many ways, both the activities of the trustees and the Metropolitan Park Commission. Quote, when shall some rich man do for some quiet lake in New England what Puckler did for his valley of the Nisei River, uh, he preserved everything that was distinctive. Well, perhaps Eliot, while traveling, had forgotten that he could reflect back to a project designed by his mentor, Olmsted, and by his uncle, Peabody. It, in many ways, at a smaller scale, uh, achieves much of the uh, distinction and significance that the Moscow estate in Germany held for Elliot during his travels, a property which now appropriately and proudly has become part of the constellation of major assets of the trustees once again. Thank you. Thank you both so much. We have time to answer a couple questions today. Um, anything that is unanswered, we will be able to respond to via email. Um, so first question, when was Dorchester Park designed? Do you mean West Roxbury Park? I mean, do you mean Franklin Park? Uh, this was referenced during Lauren's um, Lauren's okay. talk in the beginning. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to as Dorchester Park. Okay, we can always we can always respond to that via email post lecture. Okay. Okay. Um, and for Lauren, approximately how many of the six thousand projects still exist? Again, approximately. Ah, boy, that is a great question. I wish I knew the answer. Um, it's a complex problem around um, because there are six, I'm gonna, it's a little bit of a long answer. There's 6,000 um, job numbers for the period between 1857 and 1979. Um, a portion of those had plans done. Um, a portion of those were actually implemented and then a portion of those still remain today. So um, there also are cases where Olmsted, like Elliot, was a profuse 
writer, well, writer and wrote about ideas that were important in the establishment of places that aren't necessarily reflected in design and also was, was um, involved in a lot of, plan they were, the whole firm was involved in a lot of planning activities that, um, you know, again, were more about sort of, you know, infrastructure and government um, commissions and so forth. Again, not necessarily reflected in design. The further complication is that there are some sites that have multiple job numbers. Moraine Farm is an example because there were two projects undertaken by the firm almost 70 years um, apart. And there are others um, that are very large job numbers like the Fine Arts Commission in Washington, DC that in fact includes a huge number of sites. So for example, that one job number includes the mall, the White House, Roosevelt Island, um, the Jefferson Memorial, et cetera, and a lot of individual sites that the firm worked on today. So it's a complicated question, and I'm not sure anyone really knows the answer, but there are you know, efforts around the country like the Connecticut State Survey that is com uh, currently underway that will get to the bottom of that question in discrete areas. Thank you so much, Lauren. And we just have time for one more question today. Again, we will answer these um, others via email. What was the relationship between Elliot and Olmsted? Very interesting question. Um, of course, Olmsted was Elliot's mentor. Elliot called landscape architecture Mr. Olmsted's profession uh, and felt totally indebted to uh, the older man. Um, on the other hand, he would occasionally be critical of things that Olmsted was doing. <clears throat> Olmsted was very admiring of Elliot's uh, activities in creating the Metropolitan Park Commission, and at one point writes a letter to his sons and to Elliot, uh, basically to the upper administration of the OONE office, saying these are the projects that will date the history of the profession of landscape architecture. And a large number of those were projects that Elliot had envisioned through the Metropolitan Park Commission and brought into the office at that time. So they're both very similar. Uh, they work as collaborators, um, but uh, Elliot deserves to be seen as somebody with separate identity and true integrity too. <clears throat> Thank you both so much. Um, Cindy, if you wouldn't mind closing the webinar. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you'll be joining us next week for the sixth webinar in this series called State of the Coast, Salt Marsh and Habitats. For all of our webinar recordings, a list of future webinars with registration links, please visit thetrustees.org backslash webinars. And again, everything you heard about today would not be possible without our donors, especially top supporters like our Founders Circle members. So thank you again for joining us today, for investing in our mission, and for believing in a brighter future. And thank you especially to Lauren and Keith for all of this tremendous expertise and this wonderful program that you provided for us today. Thank you, everyone, and take care.